Welcome to this session. I trust everyone had a lovely lunch. Um, we will have three presentations as they were just now on the screen. But first up, I would like to introduce the two ladies that are from the University of Cape Town working on the Sia Pambili project. If you don't know what the Sia Pambili project, listen attentively. It is a project also funded by Kresge, and we do look forward to hearing what the ladies have to share with us from their work under that project. Ladies, over to you. Good afternoon, and it's really exciting to be here. This project um, is in its design phase, so it's very, um, we're very happy to be able to share it with you and hope that um, you will be as excited as we are about it and can, can feed into the project. So the, the idea of a stronger nation, um, a stronger South African nation actually came from Bill Moses. And I remember last year he, at this exact conference, he came to me with his laptop open, showing me with great enthusiasm um, this map where you could um, click on different things and we'll, we're going to be taking you through the, the concept a little bit. But just um, to give you a sense of, of of the Sia Pambili project as a whole, because the Stronger Nation Report is one of the projects that we're involved in. Um, it's a project within Seldru, which is at the University of Cape Town. And it's, as um, Guga said, it's funded by Kresge. And, but the difference or where it complements um, Sia Pumalela is that it's very much looking at the, the broader contract, co um, context. So who's accessing our university sector and our actually our um, post-secondary sector more broadly, and then, who, and then also looking at um, um, exit into the labor market and success of, of students once they leave the system. So I'm gonna hand over to, to Sam, and who's gonna give us, um, who's gonna guide us through the strong name. In 2009, President Barack Obama and the Lumina Foundation set audacious post-secondary attainment goals. President Barack Obama's goal states that the U.S. will return to the number one in the world in terms of having the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. In order to achieve this, 60% of the nation's population, adult, ad, nation's adult population between the ages of 25 and 34, would need to have earned a two-year or four-year college degree by the year 2020. The United States used to rank as number one in the world for the percentage of adults with college degrees, but as of 2009, had slid to 16th percent. Had slid to 16th place, sorry. <laughs> Using American community survey data, the 2009 college attainment rate was stagnant at 39 percent, meaning that the U.S. needed to increase the national attainment rate by 21 percentage points in a decade to reach, the, to reach its 60 percent college attainment goal by 2020. This translates to adding approximately 8 million college degrees. Taking into context the economic environment during this time period, the economic downturn of the financial crisis served as a catalyst for change, and these post-secondary attainment goals form part of the recovery plan. Given that many citizens were affected by the state of the economy, there was a sense of urgency and momentum to rebuild and emerge as a stronger nation. Countries around the world are growing their educational attainment. Given the interconnectedness of, global, of the global economy, young people are likely to confront significant competition from a highly educated workforce for future employment. As expressed by President Barack Obama, the countries that out-educate us today will out-compete us tomorrow. In comparison, the Lumina Foundation set a separate goal. For 60% of Americans between the ages of 25 to 64 to hold degrees, certificates, or other high-quality post secondary credentials by 2025. Given the expanded age range, this translates to the US higher education system producing an additional 23 million college graduates. 42 states acknowledge Lumina's vision and set goals of their own, depending on what they believed the future and current labor market would need. On average, states aim to increase their post-secondary attainment by approximately 18 percent percentage points. Some states have even introduced legislation to support their respective, the respective post-secondary attainment goals. Note there are three differences between President Barack Obama's goal and the Lumina Foundation's goal. This is the age range um, where 
President Barack Obama only looks at those aged between 25 and, six, and 34, whereas the Lumina Foundation extends the age range to, six, to 64. Um, and in terms of the Lumina Foundation also includes high quality credentials and the Lumina Foundation also adds an additional five years to its target year. Uh, whilst President Barack Obama's goal stemmed from a desire to return to world number one, Lumina's approach is focused on achieving an equitable path to close the attainment gap. Lumina has expressed that they do not believe that the need to increase post-secondary attainment rates rests on where the U.S. stands in the international rankings. Lumina does, however, point out that the percent of the American population with post-secondary credential or a degree has remained stagnant for 40 years, whilst educational attainment in other areas of the world has increased. At the time when the Lumina Foundation set the 60% attainment goal, the percentage of jobs requiring higher education today and in the future was unknown. In 2010 and 2013, Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce published reports on skills, skills forecasting which showed that by 2020, 65% of all jobs in the US economy would require post-secondary education and training. The shift, for, from, the shift from an industrial economy towards a knowledge-based economy sees an exploding demand for talent, where talent is comprised of knowledge and skills. According to the Lumina Foundation's first strategic report in 2009, in order to reach a job in today's world, a post-secondary credential is required because of knowledge and skills it stands for. Post-secondary credentials are no longer a commodity reserved for the privileged minority, but have rather become a desperate necessity to reach the middle class. Lumina is focused on building an equitable path towards achieving its 2025 goal and recognizes that this is only attainable with the help of extraordinary innovations and policies. This, this country is not going to produce the necessary 23 million additional degrees by doing more of the same. Whilst white and American population groups are on track to achieve Lumina's goal, the attainment rates for African Americans Hispanic and Afri American, sorry, Amer African American, Hispanic and American Indian population groups continue to lag behind. They therefore recognize that focused efforts must be made to assist students from these groups to ensure that they complete their qualifications. Without these intentional efforts, Lumina recognizes that the attainment gap between population groups will continue to grow and the country will not be able to produce the sought after number of graduates. Illumina therefore focuses on three groups. One is the traditional age student, two are those returning adult students who have some college education but lack a credential, and the third group is adults aged 25 to 64 with no recognized education after high school. With a quarter of the US population achieving some college but no degree, this subset of the population is a key focus group for the Illumina Foundation in reaching their 2025 goal. For example, when looking at the 2017-2020 report, the 16.4 million additional credentials were still needed to achieve their national goal by 2025. These 16.4 million credentials were split as follows amongst the, amongst the three groups Lumina focuses on. And as you'll notice, the second group with the returning adults is the largest group that Lumina is focusing on. Lumina also notes the significance of including certificates, and other high-quality credentials in the count towards the post-secondary attainment goal. It is important that these alternative paths, pathways to obtaining a credible skill are not, reserved, are not regarded as a lower-quality default credential for individuals from population groups that have traditionally been underserved. So how does Lumina communicate this information in a user-friendly way? This is the first step. The first step to fixing the shortage of post-secondary credentials is to gather the best data on the current situation. Lumina uses the relevant information from the, Amer from the annual American Community Survey and presents it in an easily accessible medium, namely the Stronger Nation interactive website. So these are just some static images of the website. Um, as you can see, we can track the post-secondary uh, attainment rates throughout the years 
You can also look at attainment from the various states. They also provide information on the metropolitan areas and the counties. And you can also explore post-secondary um, attainment by race. And you can see for each state how that differs. And then I'll show you, I highly recommend you go check out the website because it's very fun to play with. But I'll show you, they introduced a new tool called the Goal Exploration Tool. And I'll show you that on the website just to give you a little taste. If I can. Closed, sorry. Um, well, just maybe to save time, I have got some static screenshots. Um, so, on, in the goal exploration tool, the highlighted part in blue is where you can change the state. You can set the attainment rate, and you can put, change the age group and the year. So for this example, I've chosen Tennessee. And as I'll explain just now, Tennessee set their own state goal at 55%. So, and then what, so as Luminous folks on achieving an equitable path, you can click on that. And what it basically shows is that the bottom part is where they're currently at. The lines is the attainment gap. And then the shaded part is what they would need to do to close that gap in an equitable way. And then you can also, that's by uh, population group. You can also see it by age for that particular state. Um, yeah, so the Stronger Nation website is, a publicly avail is publicly available for anyone to view and use, from state governors to citizens. The ease of public access holds states socially accountable and responsible for their progress. The K-12 system, system equivalent to South Africa's basic education department, along with public and private sector partnerships, work together under the leadership of the Lumina Foundation and state governors to increase post-secondary attainment. This holistic and collaborative effort is necessary to enact the large-scale systematic change desired. So how is it going and what are the challenges the project is facing so far? Progress towards expanding post-secondary education attainment varies by region. While some states are expected to reach their respective state goal ahead of schedule, others are lagging behind. For example, this governors, the governors in Tennessee have made higher education a focus since as early as 2003. In 2013, the Drive to 55, which I think I see, the Drive to 55 initiative was launched, which aims to increase the percentage of Tennessee citizens with a post-secondary credential to 55% to by 2025. At the time of setting the goal in 2013, the state's overall attainment rate was 33.8%, and it has since risen to 42.7% as of 2017. The current governor has expressed that the state is on track to achieve its attainment goal two years ahead of schedule. In comparison to Tennessee, other states such as Rhode Island are not on track um, to achieve their goal by the target date. And there are three commonly cited reasons why some states aren't on track to achieve their goal, and that's because of a decline in enrollments, a decline in state post-secondary education budgets. All of four states have seen a decline in their budgets in high education, and an increase in tuition costs. So what did Tennessee do differently? It's that saw their significant rise in post-secondary attainment. The, rate has take, the state has taken a system-wide approach, rather than success coming from a single entity. There has been a collaborative effort to launch various other programs over the years in support of the Drive to 55 initiative. These programs include financial aid, for financial and student support, as well as public and private sector engagement. For example, Tennessee Promise, Tennessee Succeeds, and Tennessee Reconnect. Tennessee Promise is a scholarship program launched in 2014, which gives high school graduates the opportunity to earn an associate degree or post-secondary certificate, tuition and fee-free, at public community colleges and technical schools. Tennessee Succeeds is a strategic plan 
developed by the Tennessee Department of Education to align with K-12 with to align K-12 with Drive to 55. This plan helps prepare students from a young age to succeed in post-secondary education by increasing support and monitoring of programs, providing high quality grade assessments and deepening lit literacy standards. Other programs such as Tennessee Reconnect offers free community college to adults who have not earned a college degree or certificate. This program makes, makes Tennessee the first state in the United States to offer tuition-free college to adults. The Kursky Foundation is supporting Sia Pamalela, which recognizes the importance of collaborative effort to increase student achievement within the system. A stronger South African nation initiative with a user-friendly interface could provide the tool and in incentive to track and monitor attainment at a national level. Nicola will now talk about how we may conceptualize the Stronger Nation Initiative for South Africa. She will also raise some of the important differences that would need to be considered if we were to try and replicate such an initiative for our country. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so I, I have five minutes. Um, we did realize that we had too much going on but in our slide, but we didn't really know where to um, cut it, and it's all very exciting. So I suppose just to start with um, something that President Ramposa actually stated in his um, State of the Nation address, which is that South Africa does have so much going on. It's got so many reports, it's got so many indicators, um, and what he said was it's time to make a choice and to, to choose a bold and ambitious goal um, that can give us a unique purpose. And I suppose that's what the Stronger Nation um, initiative in the US does within their higher education system and where we see it could potentially um, add value for us. Um, so it's not about reproducing um, any, so I, I've noted a whole lot of initiatives that are currently going on in our, in our, um, in our um, environment that are already producing, they're using our data, they're using the administrative data um, or the household survey data to really monitor many different indicators um, to try and move us um, towards uh, South Africa with lower levels of unemployment, um, more, less poverty and more equality. So the Stronger Nation idea is to look across those different um, initiatives that are currently producing work and say, well, what would our goal be? And how could we all look towards something that could be overarching, that could guide um, at a national level? So it's, and, and then all these other more in-depth analyses would feed into um, driving that um, forward. So the big questions then are what would, our, what, would, what would the indicator be that we would track in South Africa? And what level would we track it at? You know, we've got a very different um, um, frame, or oh, we've got far fewer higher education institutions in our, in our country. So would it make sense to do something at a province level? What would the level be? Um, those kind of questions. Then also, who would take account? Would it be, which, who would really be, like the, the states in the, in the US, they, the ones that really took it on board and drove it have seen change. Whereas, what, what, how would we do that in South Africa? So if we pull out four key cons, com, components that I see as important to the, the US Stronger Nations, it's that it's a population level indicator. So instead of it being um, throughput within an institution, it's saying what percentage of their population has attained a higher a qualification that is marketable on the, in the labor market. So it's, it's a population level indicator. Something else that's nice is it's a positive indicator. You know, in South Africa, we have a tendency to, to often track things that are, are not so positive. Unemployment rate, um, the NEAT rate, um, those kind of indicators. But what's nice about um, having a goal which is positive, it's, it's almost like Sia, um, the, the Sia Pumalela conference, it gets you, it livens your spirit and, and makes you feel like you want to work forward. It also has to be very well defined. 
So this is something that we need to think quite carefully in South Africa. So in the US, they went through a transition where initially they used, so they're using, they're using household survey data. So they had to use what was measured in the, in the data. So the, the original measure that they were using was very traditional forms of qualifications. And then they refined the, um, the system to, to take a, into account different types of qualifications that actually were important in the labor market. And through that process, they actually adjusted the question in the survey. So what would we do in South Africa? That's a, another key thing that we have to think about. We also have to link it to labor market reality. What would be our um, percentage of people that need a, a, a skill? And the, the Department of Higher Education is looking at that through, through the LMIP project. Okay, and then I said, so I have no more time. Um, so I think I'm gonna have to skip over what our motivation for, remember the US they had the motivation being that they wanted to be number one and then they brought in the equity. In South Africa, it's quite different. It's, it's much more um, based on the fact that we have very high levels of unemployment high levels of poverty and inequality. So that's more of our uh, motivation. We also have an educational attainment reality that looks like this. I don't know if it's clear to you from the graphs, but let me just take two seconds to describe this graph, which is showing by birth cohort. So this is looking at people that are 25 to 35 and in the year that you were born. So everyone who was born in the same year, let's look at the distribution across educational attainment. And what you can see for those born in 1992 is that the majority are either attaining an incomplete secondary education or a metric qualification. And the share that are going into the post-school sector, and you can see I've been quite, I've used a very broad definition of, of of the, the post-schooling sector, so it's degrees, certificates, diplomas, with or without metric, and the end qualifications, is very small. It accounts for about 15% of, of, of a, a cohort um, thing. So you can see we have made huge improvements in terms of reducing the proportion of people with primary education, but there has been fairly little shift in terms of that post-secondary institution. So we have to take this reality into account. We can't um, just be looking at that subsector or even the subsector that is, is completing metric. We have to be looking at the broad, um, um, across the education distribution in order to, um, to make some change. Okay, so I'm not gonna do that. So yeah, so when we think of design, and this is my last slide, um, we need to think what is, if we say what percentage would we want as a high, um, high quality post-secondary credential? Would it be a credential? Would it be a skill? How would we, how would we define that um, percentage? We also need to think of what would our, our groups of focus be? We could look at our traditionally, traditional age students, but we also have a large need population which don't go back into the education system. So that would be another um, component, those adults who have left school without completing matric and need to come back into the system. So we need to think about how, how would we um, start include them in that goal that we would be monitoring. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop there. This graph, I'll just um, put it up. It's starting to show you that we've got extreme variation across um, our provinces and so we do need to it's, it's alluding to the fact of what level of edu um, disaggregation are we going to think about. And so, yeah, that's it. And thank you for your time. And I hope we can continue the conversation around this. Probably not today. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, unfortunately, we do not have time for questions, but I, the ladies are still here, and you're welcome to, at any moment, ask questions. I think they can give you a more elaborate explanation of what has happened in their report. Um, allow me at this moment to then welcome our next speakers, um, who will be speaking to us about metric as an indicator of success of BSc students to determine the need for support. And the ladies are from the University of Nelson, uh, from Nelson Mandela University, and they are Anneli and Christy. Over to you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
Uh, I apologize for Kirsty, she's the statistician, I'm the dummy in statistics. She can unfortunately not be here today. Um, we, I would like to start with the reasons why we have done this research. Um, for us, a high uh, success rate in the new BEC dietetics course was important. It is a new pro program that started in 2013, and it is quite expensive due to the large practical component of the program, and also the fact that from the third year, it's very much one-to-one -one education, so the staff component, component is quite large. Um, dietitians are most needed in food insecure rural areas, and therefore we also try to attract students from these areas. Before I go further, I would like to say that thank you. We obtained funding for the project from Sia for Malela and also from our for our university management. The project was done. Uh, it, it, it's not only me and Kirsty that's involved. Our Center for Teaching and Learning Media, as well as CAR, our Center for Ex, um, Access Admission Research, uh, are also involved in the project, but this specific section was just done by, by the two of us. Uh, in 2018, we reported on uh, focus groups uh, that we held with all the students on indicators of success from the student's perspective. Some of the results that we found was that they say that school did not prepare them for university anymore, but they did agree that mathematics is important and plays a role, and also that students from the quintile one to three schools, that's mainly in the rural areas where we would like to attract students from, need more support. Uh, this presentation is in specific about the statistics to see, compared to the perceptions of the students, what do we find. Um, we focused first on modules that the students do where they are not as successful or where the marks are not that good. And we compared that with the metric scores. Uh, the physiology and nutrition are two of these modules, and performance in mathematics and biology in matrix showed no significant difference. But for chemistry, mathematics and biology made a significant difference. Performance in science in school did also not show any significant difference. But if you look at it, you will see that for the chemistry, there is a significant difference with a moderate practical significance. But for physiology, for example, it's maybe not significantly different, but there is a difference. If you look at biology, as we have said, uh, it does play a role for, for chemistry with a moderate practical significance. And uh, especially for physiology, it does play a role, although not statistically significant. And as said, science did not, uh, in school did not show any significant differences. Um, the average metric score, or APS, um, also showed a significant difference between those that an a had an APS of uh, less than 40 and those that had 40 or more. Um, and there were no significant, but definitely small differences for, for those who had an APS score of 38 to 40. Um, up to this year, our requirement for BEC Dietetics was a, a, an APS score of 38. Um, if we look at the uh, uh, stats, you can see that it's really statistically significant um, in the first as well as in the second year, with a large practical significant for both years. Here I would like also to refer to the CARS testing scores, and those are students who had below the 38, that is the score that we require, from 37 down to approximately usually 31, 32. And we saw that in those cases, if we do accept the students, we had to give numeracy support, 
um, supplemental instruction support, as well as academic strategy support, um, as was found by the course. Uh, and then, of course, we had to monitor their progress. Uh, as we said, the, this type of school played a role, and we looked at the um, quintile one to three versus quintile four, five, and private schools, and there was a significant difference between the pass rates in the first and second year of the students from quintile one to three versus those of the other schools. If we look at the statistics, you can see that it also has a large signific uh, practical significance. Uh, so, in conclusion, we start with new criteria, and the new criteria has a score of 390, that is more or less 65%, that we can, from both the testing at course and what we have found, see that it is necessary to have a high um, admission score, and at least 60% for mathematics and physical science. You have seen that physical science does, there's no significant difference, but for now we will keep that and we will monitor the situation and see. At the moment, we do not require any, uh, require, any entrance requirement for biology, um, but that is another aspect that we will have to monitor and see whether it's not necessary uh, down the line. And I feel that we do not give enough attention to languages. We have here heard from uh, quite a few of the um, presentations that that is important, and I think that's something that we should look at. We also must give additional academic support, and especially what we call social support. And I think we have heard from all universities that that is the case for our students from point oh one and three uh, schools. We need further research for the development of a structured support program. We have already started from last year with a support program, especially in study skills and in writing skills. Um, as we can see that there are gaps there. Um, and we have opened it up for all in health sciences, all the departments in health sciences, as mo most of them also have the same problems as we have. Um, but there is definitely much more research needed as we do not um, attract the students that really need those programs because it's a vo voluntary program. So we rather get students who would have in any case passed, um, although then that's for them, for, for them also they pass better, but we would like to have those students that actually need that support. That is the references and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anneli did quite well with her time, eight minutes. Um, we have some time for questions. As she mentioned, please try and limit your statistical questions um, because Chrissy is not here. So do we have any questions on the floor for Anneli? Go for it. Sorry, could you repeat? I could. <laughs> That's, um, I taught biology a long time ago, and the indicator that was most successful in, and showing uh, success in biology was English. Yes. So your comment about the, the languages, I think, is, a, is, is apt, and maybe you could use that in your analyses. We do find that approximately 50% of our students are coming from rural areas uh, and speak Isikosa, and another 20% are Afrikaans speaking students. So uh, only 30% of our students are English speaking. Uh, and it definitely, especially also, as you say, in the biology, plays a very big role, and also then in modules like physiology. 
where they have many new terms in English to learn. So definitely a presentation for Siapumelela 2020, I assume. Any other questions? Well, on that note, thank you very much, Anneli. Let's give her a round of applause. I just want to check with tech support if we're ready for the next one. Okay, so we're ready to roll. Um, the next presentation um, is also from the Nelson Mandela University. And this is a joint presentation, but only Del Rey will be presenting. Um, Prof, uh, Foxcroft is just nodding. Um, so this presentation will look at, through the looking glass, a theoretical perspective on the promotion of student success. So we look forward to hearing at what has been happening at Nelson Mandela University in this regard. And over to you, Del Rey. Good afternoon, everybody. I think I'll just start talking while we're waiting for this to come through. Um, there we are. Oops, I can see it, but you can't. Okay. Um, through the Looking Glass, a novel by Lewis Carroll is the inspiration for our title. Um, But the thing, the, the object of viewing is student success. And what I'm showing you on the screen now are some statistics from the Student Counseling Career and Development Center at the Nelson Mandela University um, in, for term one um, of this year and comparing that with um, the last, you know, if we look at a five year comparison. I'm sure you all know of the numbers of successful attempts at your universities. Um, at our university, when we looked at this earlier this year, we were stunned to discover a, sh a steep increase in the number of attempts from one in 2015 to eight this year in, and, and 10 last year. Um, the number of students thinking about committing suicide are even larger, or were even larger, with 30 in 2018, 30 in 2019, this year. These are only the ones coming through our doors, the ones we know about. Um, so the experience of the student journey, let alone its, its success, can literally become a matter of life and death not just for one or two students, but for many. So what's my point? Um, my point is, I'd like to introduce you to um, some of the theoretical perspectives that our staff in our de department or unit um, started exploring. And this presentation supports the view that student success must be conceptualized as a multifaceted construct. We all understand that. Um, and that the facets are determined very much by the lenses through which they are viewed. The metaphorical looking glasses in each of our possession. Does success look and feel the same through different eyes? We, we uh, have been taking more pains to consult with students and ask them what success means to them. Um, but are we aware of the lenses that we've been picking up and at which points in time or which stages we are using those lenses? If our goal is the pursuit of data analytics on success indicators as a means of monitoring and supporting success, then we need to be very aware of our specific looking glasses that we're using to view success and to collect data on it. Um, so I'm going to show you some lenses um, and point you towards one particular lens. This is a very interesting map developed by a PhD student um, which maps out the range of student development theories out there. And if we just dip into one theoretical conglomeration, which is student development theories, one could get quite overwhelmed, I know I do. 
But what I like about this map um, is that it's a great example of a visual methodology that can be employed to broaden our data collection approaches in operationalizing success indicators. So, in other words, it can help us to bring data points from different theories together into one picture. Um, and, and I'm very interested in, in working with, with all of that from that type of perspective, from the mapping perspective and the integration perspective. But while student development theories are great and valuable, the body of knowledge that I want to point us towards today is that of wellness. Um, the concept of wellness focuses on lifestyle behaviors which contribute towards individuals living to their fullest potential, the ideal state of being. Um, Oftentimes, wellness, the term has been confused with the term or used at the, at, as in the same breath as the concept of health, of health, which is about illness or the relationship of the individual um, with the illness status, whereas wellness is a much more holistic concept. And what I like about it is that while, if we think about those 30 students, who this year were thinking about suicide. And we could, we could go and we could try to speak to people such as those, theoretically speaking, once they're stabilized, and look backwards and start developing um, typical paths of what the challenges were that they encountered so that we can collect indicators of those to monitor our students more generally, right? That's the looking back approach. What the wellness approach does is it directs us towards the forward perspectives. So instead of always looking backwards, we're looking, we're encouraging our students and ourselves as support staff to observe what is ahead as students move towards that ideal state. And then, we need to be clear about what that ideal state actually encompasses, isn't it? So the ideal state for me would be a perfect sense of well-being, right? Now too often, now well-being um, by definition is described as the balance point between an individual's resource pool and the challenges they, they face. When, they, when, when, they are, when their resource pool bank is empty, they're going to start feeling hopeless and all kinds of horrible things start setting in. Wellness helps us to focus on the factors that enable well-being. So in pursuit of wellness, I'm going to take you very quickly through a number of wellness theories. And I just want to point out small things about each one. Um, a distinguished psychologist by the name of Cohen said in 1991, and I like this quote, that the focus of modern psychology should be to build wellness rather than contain troubles. And if we think about this in relation to student success, how can we start building our analytics as a mechanism towards enabling greater levels of well-being rather than reporting on the troubles and what we need to do to mitigate those as challenges to success. Um, Halbert Dunn, Dr. Dunn, was the first one, he's done now, um, who in 1961 <laughs> came up with the very first model of wellness. I like it, it's pretty, but it's only got three little circles. And he, he spoke about now, as conceptualizing the ideal state as consisting of body, mind, and spirit. It's interesting to me how spirituality comes in through so many theories. And in the, the wellness context, or the concept of wellness, we're not talking about religion. We're talking about a sense of, it could be religiousness, it could be um, whatever, connecting you to a, something larger than yourself giving you a sense of meaning and purpose. Um, 
and Dunn's arrow depicts the life trajectory of the individual. Donald Ardell, 1977, added self-responsibility. I like this when we think about students. We so often go into rescue mode, and, um, and that's good, and that's right, and we must keep doing that, but what are we doing to build the student's sense of self-responsibility and empower them and enable them to lift their levels of wellness in these different dimensions. Now you'll see these theorists um, have, as the years gone by, expanded on the components of wellness that we could be collecting data on. Um, Ardell spoke about nutrition, he spoke about environmental sensitivity, physical fitness, stress awareness and management. Dr. William Hitler um, was the first uh, to actually bring the concept of wellness into the academic field and he created the first campus wellness program for students. Um, I know, I think it's UFS that has a lovely wellness program for students as well, and there are different initiatives across our institutions. Um, the Nelson Mandela University actually developed a wellness questionnaire based on this model, which was classified by the Health Professions Council as a psychological test in 2011. And we've been using that pretty successfully, but it's up for revision very soon. Um, Travis and Ryan, added the, the idea of wellness as a continuum. So we can go from failure and dropout on the one hand to what on the other hand if we think about student success. What is it to be a truly successful student? And that's where we start getting into conversations around graduate attributes um, and other things like, uh, oh, Travis and Ryan also added an iceberg model which uh, the president and CEO of Achieving the Dream also referred to yesterday morning. Um, the things that we can't see, the things beneath the surface, lifestyle issues, psychological issues, spirituality, meaning, sense of being. Um, Whitman Sweeney, now you can see there's so many details coming out. They centered everything. Um, around spirituality and self-regulation though, which I thought was very interesting. And they also started bringing in context. And, and in our case, in our country, context is very, very, very important. At our table yesterday, during the workshop, um, examples were being given such as students who are given a NISFAS loan, but are sending it home because their families are hungry. Context, context matters. And then they're sitting here hopeless and struggling. Um, the indivisible self, Myers and Sweeney brought in this concept that the self cannot be divided actually. And it's very important that when we think about supporting students, that we, don't, we must be aware that change in one area can cause change in another. Challenge in one area can cause challenge in another. Support in one area necessitates support in another. Um, Troy Adams and colleagues um, added something unique in their emphasis on the subjectivity, the crucial role of subjective perceptions in determining wellness. Um, that's very important. So consulting with our students about the factors affecting them are very important as we all know but it's, it makes it difficult in that we can't impose. Um, SAMHSA added um, later to the eight-factor wellness model sexuality. In the student context, sexuality is very, very important. There are lots of issues stemming from that which um, must also be taken cognizance of. Um, Van Lingen, one of my colleagues, incidentally, at the Nelson Mandela University, uh, developed a, the first South African model of wellness um, and put that out in a publication in 2012. And one of the th three most important things is firstly her addition of financial wellness 
And secondly, the way that she merged wellness theory with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Very often, we address students at high level needs when their basic needs are not being met. And we, I've already heard lots of conversation about this, but it's, it's satisfying to see it put into a theoretical model, isn't it? Um, so she's gone from the bottom up, and she's saying, well, physical and financial needs are the most basic needs, and we've got to see to that first. Then we can talk about their social and environmental career needs. Then we can talk about their spiritual, intellectual, emotional, psychological needs. I know the counselors at student counseling at the Nelson Mandela University often find that therapy is paralyzed by the fact that basic needs are not being met. Um, Australian theorists used the same model, the same dimensional structure as Hitler's, but what they did was, which I found noteworthy, was the addition of permeable borders representing the interactions between the dimensions. So really saying we can't just focus on one aspect of life, we need to look at all of it. Um, and they also acknowledge the importance of the individual's internal and external context. Coming to some work that um, I did with Cheryl and Prof, uh, Prof Foxcroft and Prof Stroud, um, we have the beginnings of a tentative new model of student wellness. And what is new about that, in a, as with uh, Van Ling in 2012, we've got the financial aspect added in there, but for the first time, academic wellness is coming up as a dimension. We held focus groups with students, uh, Afrikaans focus groups, English focus groups, and um, focus groups with people from the Isikrosa language group, students. And from what they told us and the facet analyses that were conducted, they identified that there are three main areas of academic wellness that they found important. One was positive individual traits or internal qualities like resilience, um, being achievement oriented, academic skills, study habits, time management, and engagement with learning. And a lot of our support initiatives um, as institutions have targeted the bottom two, but not much is being done yet to focus on the development of the, the top one, the positive individual traits, the internal qualities that are vital to success. Um, so in summary, the key concepts of wellness that um, I thought were so applicable to the student context is, is seeing success as something happening on a continuum. And if I think about the data, it's not enough for me to collect data on the end point of the year or of the student journey in terms of, well, did we get from year one into year two? Did we, did we get to graduation? It's what's happening along the way that becomes vital to me. And are we collecting data at a holistic level or are we only looking at one or two levels or three levels? Are we acknowledging that um, there's this process-driven uh, nature to success as well? Um, how do we nurture that so that students can reach their optimal functioning, that ideal state, and that they can actually become um, or get to a place where they actually enjoy the student lifestyle rather than get bogged down with the negativity of the struggle? Altogether, it takes a village. Um, and I thank you for your time and listening to this very theoretical uh, presentation. Thank you very much, um, Dalry. Something worth considering and worth thinking about. Um, I hope everyone's still tweeting, still reflecting on such a, on these moments. At this moment, I would still like you to be at the podium, Dalry. Um, because there might be questions for you. Are there any questions on the floor for Dalry? Comments, reflections, thoughts?
Thank you for a very insightful presentation. Um, Dalry, a question for me. Um, firstly, I'm just struck by the fact that you and Professor Foxcroft um, work together, and it seems like there's a synergy across campus. Um, how did you, what did the institution do right to um, manage an integrative approach from student support services um, with institutional leadership? Thank you for the question. Um, student counseling career and development as a department actually resides within um, the umbrella division that Foxcroft uh, directs. So um, rather than being um, underneath student affairs as an umbrella, we're working directly underneath Prof Foxcroft. And she is the supervisor of my doctoral thesis on the topic. <laughs> Inside story. <laughs> Any other questions? On that note, thank you very much, Dalray.